I, I had a great opportunity on Thursday to meet with clergy of the diocese, and we talked about some very practical uh, observations and in initiatives that we can do in, in our parishes. Uh, in, our, in our diocese, we've had uh, a great opportunity, especially in the last five years following our major gift uh, campaign that has raised $36 million to date, to delve into those areas of stewardship that, that are on a practical level, but because they're practical and because they're measurable, they provide a really good lens in which we can uh, observe uh, stewardship happening in our parishes. And so the, the, the title of my, uh, my presentation is uh, Best Practices That Lead to Vibrant Ministry. So uh, it, it's, it's really helpful for us to understand that while we want to impart on people an understanding of what it means to be extravagantly generous, we also need to be able to have a roadmap that's going to help us get there. And so these best practices help us achieve that. The benefits of best practices is that they allow us to have something by which we can measure our success against. So how, how did I come about, how did we in the Diocese of Toronto come about 14? It's not some sort of special number like 12 or 3 that we see uh, evidentiary in, in scripture. It came about as a result of consultation with what we identified back in 2010 as our 30 most successful parishes. So in the Diocese of Toronto we have 212 parishes and we were able to make a clear assessment as to who's healthy and who isn't. And we felt that if we went out to those top 30 parishes and had a conversation with them about what is it that you're doing that sets you apart? What are those yardsticks that you're using that are helping you get consistent results, indications that you're, you're healthy? You're, and those indicators tended to be uh, in, ever-increasing support on the offertory plate and growth of the congregation. And so as a result of that, we were able to identify that it, it is in fact these best practices that are the best and, and leading indicators for us as to, uh, as to parish success. Now, there's nothing special, as I said, about 14. It just reflects the key areas that were identified. And the best practices aren't limited to financial indicators. There's indicators there that are of a congregational nature, that uh, are reflective of, of ministry and leadership health. And it's not just focused exclusively on lay leadership, it's it, it's an, it encompasses the entire parish, uh, lay leaders involved in other capacities, and of course we can't neglect our clergy because they play, play an important element, an important role in all that we do. In fact, uh, I, I would argue that without the clergy's enthusiastic support, of anything that we do, virtually everything we do is destined to be, uh, I won't say a failure, it just, it won't be as successful as it possibly could be. So uh, the first best practice that we were, uh, I'm just gonna move on through this one because I only have 20 odd minutes. So the first best practice, you gotta have a committee. You gotta have a key, a key, a key, a key group of individuals that are in place to initiate uh, a stewardship initiative in your parish. It, I, and I would suggest actually it not fall on the shoulders of the treasurer and the wardens. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sure, I'm sure the treasurers and the wardens in this room are so glad to hear that. Please, please, I mean we have tried so hard over the years to try and not make stewardship synonymous with money. Please don't have the chair of the stewardship committee as the, as the treasurer as well. Not, you know, it, it's just that, that it, it's, it's just not a, good comp, not a good fit. Although I understand in some parishes invariably that that person might have the appropriate skill set. I'm just conscientious about how people uh, view and, and make connections between what we do in stewardship and perhaps what we do in other capacities to put a new roof on the church or to, to replace the boiler. 
So it, it's absolutely critical that we have a leadership committee in place, people who are going to, uh, to be able to connect with other people in the congregation. So we have somebody involved in communications, communicating that stewardship message. People who are involved in helping to put together the mechanics of that, that program over the course of the year. And I think in most of cases, most of our parishes need a committee of between four and six to adequately uh, introduce any sort of year-round stewardship initiative. Uh, as, as I said uh, initially, that uh, clergy are, have to be committed to stewardship education. Uh, they set the stage and they lay the foundation for anything that we do in our parishes. And without their example and leadership, we're not going to be as successful as we can be. Our, our clergy need to be exemplary givers as well, because if they're going to be preaching about generosity, they have to model it in their own behaviors and their own lifestyle. They have to be able to speak with credibility. I couldn't go out on a stage and talk to people about the benefits of sacrificial giving or giving proportionately unless I was one of them as well. I can't go on and talk about the benefits of supporting uh, our faith, our hope, which was our year-round stewardship, our, our, um, sorry, our, our major gift campaign, unless I was a donor to that campaign as well. It adds credibility and it demonstrates that you're supportive and, and behind the work and the initiatives that the lay people in your parish are doing. So we need to have committed clergy to that, to that process. Um, it's important that we, uh, we introduce people to the idea of giving regularly. And that's why I say there has to be some sort of annual uh, giving pledge program that exists in your parishes. Uh, I, I realize that for some people the idea of pledging is about as, in, as, about as something they, they enjoy doing about as much as their, their annual taxes. But, but pledging is an important aspect of what we do because it, it forces us to prayerfully consider the gifts that we're going to make and, and ensure that we've made reasonable provision to support the ministry of our church and to give back to God what is God's in the first place. So uh, I, I say joyful. It, it's interesting because when I first started working at the Diocese of Toronto, I actually called it sacrificial. And I got so much flack for the word <laughs> sacrificial. The idea that people should have to give something up to give back to God. It, it didn't matter how, long, how much I protested about the idea of giving back, that in fact, we're called to be a generous people as, a, as an indication of our, of our discipleship. But in order to make my life a lot easier, I just scratched out the word sacrificial and I stuck in joyful. And guess what? I have no problems anymore. I'm able to convey the exact same message by simply changing one word. So we, we do encourage uh, 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 an annual joyful giving pledge initiative. And I know in the wonderful resource that my friend Glenn has put together, there's an outline of several ways in which you can do uh, a pledging initiative. In fact, he outlines four. And I'm gonna tell, I tell parishes right off the bat, parishes that don't engage in any sort of pledging whatsoever, you are missing out on a wonderful opportunity to engage with members of your congregation and you will get, I guarantee you, if you do one of those initiatives properly, you will get between 10 and 30% return on your investment the first year you do it. And so usually that lights up the eyes of the people who I'm talking with and initially sets them down uh, a road in which they, they do this. But please make the provision that you're going to do this on an annual basis. Don't view it as a one-off. Don't say we're gonna try it or we've tried that before. Make it an annual part of what you're doing in your parish. You will see the, the, the results and it's a way of constantly connecting with newcomers because people are always uh, coming to our parishes. They may not be in large numbers, but they need to be invited to be part of that giving process. Uh, I would like to believe that we can get every member of our congregation involved in some form of ministry. And so pledging of time and talent is equally as important as making a gift of your treasure. We cannot neglect the fact that time and talent plays a vital role in the, in, 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 in the giving of treasure as well. So uh, we, we've, the, the objective of getting everybody involved in some sort of ministry is in, is in a sense, what we're trying to do is raise the affinity in the church product. 
the more pe closely people are connected and engaged in the ministry of the church, the more likely it is that they're going to become enthusiastic supporters of us as well financially. And so we're trying to help people realize that as part of their discipleship, a part of what it is to be a Christian, it's not sufficient enough just to show up on a Sunday. That's not the extent of Christian life. It has to do with our engagement in our lives as Christians as well. And that extends to prayer, to regular reading of scripture, to engaging in other ministries and in doing outreach. It's absolutely essential that people view their life as a Christian as being more than simply showing up on a Sunday. And so we want to really encourage people to be involved in that, that giving of their time and talent to the life and ministry of the church.